Paul Cassidy is a research assistant with over 20 years experience in the sustainable housing and energy fields. Paul is presently working on several projects including straw bale housing projects and bioenergy units. In his presentation, Paul discusses how smaller micro-scale units are more useful than traditional larger units for transforming biomass into energy and useful byproducts. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about, as mentioned previously, uh, the learnings that I've gained through my recent research about biomass transformation technologies, in particular, the advantages of micro-scale technologies that transform biomass into bioenergy and to various byproducts. Aside from transforming biomass into steam, which is the traditional energy process that's been around since the start of the Industrial Revolution, I've observed three major processes to transform biomass into energy and byproducts through micro units. When I say micro units, these are units that um, can be generally can be transportable, um, and you're certainly looking at much smaller than the size of a house. Um, and um, the, the main types that, that I've noticed are basically combined heat and power units. Uh, these units produce uh, something called syngas, uh, synthetic synthesis gas, um, which I'll give some more detail about later, um, to produce electricity and heat. Um, there's, the next one is gasification units. These also produce um, syngas. They also produce biochar. Um, and the final one are pyrolysis units. You could almost see pyrolysis units as being extended versions of a gasification unit in that quite often a pyrolysis unit, depending on what the client wants, you can turn certain taps off um, so that uh, when it's producing everything, all of its byproducts, it's producing syngas, uh, biochar, wood vinegar, uh, and pyrolysis oil, um, depending on the client's needs. Transforming biomass with microscale units at, at or near its source uh, presents a really strong alternative to the age old economic edict of economies of scale for a number of reasons. This one really did my head in when I started when I started really understanding it, because I've got an economics background, I did a Bachelor of Commerce many, many moons ago. Um, and so the economies of scale was something that was drummed into my head. Uh, some of the reasons that this occurs, I'll, I'll show on the next slide. As it mentions here, um, large scale and bioenergy units face some significant challenges. England at the moment is importing vast amounts of wood chips from different countries to fuel old coal fired power stations. South Korea's also got the same strategy, transforming vast amounts of their forest into biomass energy at the expense of wind and solar. Um, so they've gone down the track of um, bioenergy in a really big way, as I mentioned, at the expense of wind and solar. Um, the benefits of such choices um, can seem to be quite dubious um, as trees have to be cut down to provide the wood chips and then transported. Such systems also have the same problems as any centralized power grid. Research has shown with the clean energy grid that's being proposed in Australia will require an extra 10,000 kilometers of new transmission lines, um, which is quite staggering really. Um, they can only be built with community backing and will require a massive amount of copper and aluminium to build. Another factor is large transmission losses. As you transmit energy over distance, um, some of that energy is lost to the atmosphere. Um, so if you're looking at those pictures of the, the um, high tension wires, as, as you went from kilometer to kilometer, you'll be losing power step by step. Um, so the amount, if it's being transmitted very long distances at the end of, of a line can be quite quite significant, the losses. And this is a really big impact in communities uh, that I've had something to do with down in, in Gippsland, the La Trobe Valley, a lot of the branch communities. By the time the power actually gets down to the, the, the town at the end of the branch community, quite often um, the, the power source is quite depleted. Uh, finally, if there's a breakdown in the grid, it results in massive disruptions to a broad area. 
Uh, this could result from fires, floods, or even sabotage. Because climate change is increasing in its intensity each year, this impact and the resultant skyrocketing repair costs are likely to increase, to increase also. What I wanted to focus on uh, tonight are the advantages of the decentralized use of smaller units and, the, their, um, and their advantages. Uh, the range, firstly, that the range of microscale biomass transforming units that I mentioned previously, producing a range of byproducts. The second factor is such units can remote in remote sites in conjunction with the relevant, uh, the relevant harvesting technologies. An example of this is the potential to actually use such technologies up in Northern Queensland, where prickly acacia, which is an invasive species, one of the many things that we've introduced to Australia, um, has taken over somewhere between about seven and 20 million hectares of prime cattle land, um, making it totally useless for, uh, for, uh, for cattle grazing. Um, but it's, an, a very, um, it's, it's a form of biomass. So it could easily be transformed by massive harvesters, chipped and used uh, to be used by these uh, micro units to produce a whole range of different byproducts, whether it's energy, uh, wood vinegar, um, as I mentioned later, has uh, well over 50 different uh, uses and biochar is an also extremely useful um, adjunct to, for agriculture. Um, the other advantage of uh, this will mean that the unit, because the units are relatively easy to transport from one site to the next, um, the biomass can be harvested in a particular space and then the, the unit can be moved on to another. Um, and, not, and so therefore you don't have to have the biomass being trans, transported to a centralized processing point. Finally, it, it will also mean that only the high value byproducts will need to be transported to, uh, to their markets. The, use of bi um, the uses of syngas, biochar, wood vinegar, and sometimes pyrolysis oil. Um, these are the, the main byproducts of uh, the, both the gasification processes and uh, well, all the three the processes that I mentioned previously. Syngas, as I mentioned, are uh, called synthetic gas. Uh, basically, uh, this, one, uh, this, can, this can also be generated from coal as well as biomass. Um, and has been done so for, for quite a long time. Prior to natural gas, a long time ago, um, my mum my and dad told me of, uh, that we used to have what's called town gas, uh, which is a form of synth synthesis gas uh, that was produced from coal. Um, they even ran cars through, uh, by it, through using it during World War II. Um, the form that's used for uh, you, uh, creating it from biomass uh, requires pyrolysis or gasification units. Uh, the resultant syngas is composed of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methane and nitrogen. As mentioned, it can be used to produce electricity or heat. Um, when you're looking at biochar, biochar was, uh, has been shown to be, that was used in uh, South American, the Amazon culture, well over a thousand years ago. Uh, and they used that to regenerate and like almost create soil that many of the soils in the Amazon area uh, are meters deep where they actually uh, created this biochar and it's simply burning uh, woody material with minimal or no oxygen. Uh, so basically the, the it, it, the, instead of burning, the, the actual log will slowly smolder and create um, this wonderful biochar. And it has this amazing capacity to be able, you can put a whole range of different soil supplements. If you mix that with the biochar, they're able to sit within the biochar and enable uh, quite amazing results in terms of 
uh, revitalizing, regenerating, and uh, bringing together soils that have lost a lot of their soil structure, which often happens with modern agriculture. There are at least 55 uses for biochar, mainly used in soil remediation, but there has been some exciting um, research done into its use in the creation of graphene, which is, I don't know how many people are aware of it, but it's the new potential wonder metal that can um, be much stronger than steel, um, very expensive to make, uh, and the potential to actually create it through biochar has just been started to be researched. The, another uh, byproduct of this process is called wood vinegar, uh, which also has many uses. Um, both existing and potential. Um, one of the things that it can actually, it's um, be used as a, as a herbicide and as a growth stimulant. The interesting thing that I've discovered recently is depending on the temperature at which the uh, pyrolysis is done to create the wood vinegar. So if it's done at a very low temperature, um, relatively speaking, um, you will tend to get a growth stimulant that uh, the wood vinegar will be used as a growth stimulant. If you increase the temperature of that production process, uh, the higher the temperature, the more the bypro or the, the wood vinegar will tend to be used more for as a herbicide. So um, quite an interesting process. Um, the other, the other uh, potential use is increasing the effectiveness of chemical fertilizers and thus the amount of required of them to grow the same value of crops. Um, I've been able to have some discussions with a company that makes wood vinegar in Australia. And they've, they've found that some of the farmers that are using their wood vinegar, and, and there's a huge variety in wood vinegars that are made. Uh, as I mentioned, depending on the crops that are being used, uh, the biomass that's used, to, to make it and also the, uh, the process which, with which it's made. But they're finding that the farmers that are using their, their wood vinegar are able to reduce the amount of chemical fertilizers to grow the same amount of crops by sometimes, sometimes over 60 to 70%, um, which obviously will have uh, a massive impact on, uh, it will enable the reduction of the negative impact of these fertilizers on arable land that they're used on, reduce the amount of these fertilizers in our food, and uh, just as importantly, reduce the cost to farmers of fertilizing the land. At the moment, the cost of superphosphate to a farmer has skyrocketed in recent years to be around $1,400 a ton. Um, and it's creating enormous financial pressures for farmers. Um, which is an interesting how things are moving in that direction because it will hopefully mean that they'll become a lot more open to using different means, ways and means of actually fertilising their crops. Um, so we'll see how that develops as time goes by. Um, the, another um, byproduct that I mentioned uh, that's mentioned on that chart is pyrolysis oil. At the moment, it's 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 a uh, a byproduct that's be, that is undeveloped. There's, it has potential to be used in fuels and a whole range of different things and research has been done in that way, but not nothing concrete has really uh, come out of it at the moment. The final one is um, there's the beginnings of research into the use, into the creation of um, uh, hydrogen from biomass, directly from biomass, uh, therefore, enabling biomass to be made in small scale um, in isolated areas. Uh, it's sort of my fancy, my fantasy sort of grows about the potential to be able to therefore almost fuel hydrogen trucks, which are coming onto the market. I think Volvo's got a uh, hydrogen truck coming onto the market in two years time, um, which obviously means they'd be able, if there were transport, uh, like fueling stations, hydrogen fueling stations, uh, would mean that the whole northern part of Australia could be uh, serviced by these trucks. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have later. Thank you.